which the Lord laid on my heart. All yesterday I had so much interruption that I couldn't prepare it. Last night and all the way through the night with my dear wife contributing to that factor. This morning when I got down here, still couldn't put it together properly. But I'm going to share it. You know why? Because I said, God, why well, so much opposition? Mm -hmm. Is it the word? And God said, it is the enemy who is trying to stop you. Mm -hmm. What is the title of my word? Deception or reception? Deception or reception? Does one ever count how much deception there is in the Christian church? Does one ever stop and think about it when Jesus Christ said in the end times one of the greatest spirits ruling over the Christian church all over the world? But let's forget about the world now because I'm not preaching to the world, I'm preaching to you. Right? So I'm interested in those in the church. There is so much deception that is going on inside of the Christian church. Because they are not receiving what the Spirit is saying. And God has got to cause a spiritual awakening. A spiritual awakening for each one of us. So I want you firstly to open your Bible with me. Uh, to the book of Timothy, in 2 Timothy. I've managed to put a few little things down so I don't go wandering around the world because it will take more than 80 days. But in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 10, it says this, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, Oh, what a way to start. But you have carefully followed my doctrine. There are many doctrines in the world, but what doctrine do we follow? There are many spirits in the world. As Pastor John preached last week, there are many voices in the world. But what voice are we listening to? But you have carefully followed my doctrines, my manners of life, my purpose, my faith, my long sufferings, my love, my perseverance, my persecutions, my afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at like Lyconium, and at Lystra. Now, three very places. Why did he name those three places? Well, firstly, the first one was at Antioch, which means instead of instead of, it was a counterfeit. That's exactly what the name means if you want to look them up in, in your concordances and find. So first he said, I went to a place, this is where I had all of the opposition because if there's something, instead of the Spirit of God being there, there was something instead of. The Spirit of God was definitely there, but in, there was also, instead of, there was a counterfeit trying to move in the midst of the people. And then at Iconium, and Iconium means, and when I come, I come. And I, when I came there, I found the, the opposition fighting against me. It was not a coincidence, it was a devil incident that was taking place in the life of the people. And then I came to Lystia. And what does Lystia mean? That which dislikes or that which displeases. So Paul was disliked, he was displeased, it was the doctrine he was preaching to them, they didn't like it. A lot of Christians don't like the doctrine of the Jesus Christ sometimes, but they've got to learn to, to suck it up and receive it. That's right. Receive the Word of God and follow after the Word of God. Look, it's amazing. I'm going to tell you truthfully, Louise will remember this back in the early days there. We used to have so many people come to the church. You know what they told me? Pastor David, I love you. I love the praise. I love the worship. I love your preaching, but you're too strong with the Word. Too strong. In other words, we don't want you to be so preaching the truth, we want you to dilute it down. The blood will never lose its power. No, amen. And so long as we're kept under the power of the blood, we will always have the power and the, the exunimous dynamic powers of God flowing through our lives. Amen. One thing I made a promise to God, 
When I first became a, a Christian is I'll never compromise with my experience. That is one word you will never, ever, ever find in the Bible. Compromise. You can get your concordances out, you can get all your, all your electronic gadgets out, you'll never find the word compromise in the Bible. It's a word that is not in God's vocabulary. Yeah. There is no compromise. You're either in the kingdom or you're out. You're either black or you're white, there's no grey. There's no grey, black or white is what we are in the, in the presence of God. So then he continued to say, what persecution I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Out of everything, whatever's going on, God delivered him. And God is in the business of delivering those who keep their focus on him. You might, the enemy might think he's winning for a time, but you, Jesus Christ said, you are more than a conqueror. And if you're more than a conqueror, the reason why you're more than a conqueror is you don't do the fighting, he does the fighting for you. And that's how you become more than a conqueror. When you come to the place that you can lay down your arms and release the Spirit, let the Spirit flow through you, that then you are more than a conqueror. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Jesus Christ, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Jesus Christ, will suffer persecution. How often have you been suffering persecution? Every time you open your mouth and you tell people about Jesus, how popular are you then? Now you know when you're being persecuted it's because God's on your case and God is strengthening you and God is building you up. God is strengthening you and God is building you up. The first church I ever pioneered, I was under more persecution than I would ever know that was beyond measure as a soldier in the, in the Australian regular army. Oh, did I suffer persecution, but it made me strong and strengthened me because I knew Jesus Christ was with me. Verse 13. Evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse. He's talking about in the church, evil men and imposters in the church will grow. They're not going to reduce and shrink. They're going to grow. That's why you've got to hold on to the apostles' doctrine. Not doctrine, because in the Bible there are many doctrines of demons. But we need to know the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ, to which Paul the Apostle was uh, held on to unto death. Amen. And evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse. Deceiving, deceiving, and being deceived. Deceiving and being deceived. Evil men. They're going to be deceived and they're going to be, hey, but when did this begin? When did this begin? Stop and think. When did this begin? Evil men. Seducers, impostors. And that comes from, when you read about in the scripture there, it actually comes from a Greek word which is called planos or plane or plane ao. Yeah. They all come from the planets. People are drawing from a strength that comes from the planets. And all, each one of the words, plain A, plain os, or plain us, they all bring about, cause a wandering. Firstly, they cause a wandering in the mind. And you come to church and you find your mind is wandering around. You find your, your mind is, you're counting how many bricks are in the wall, and you counted it last week and the week before and the week before, and there's still the same amount of bricks in, the, in, the, in there. Or you count how many people are on the platform singing and praising worship. There was eight. Last week, and there's still eight this week, and there's going to be eight next week, but you still count them. Because the devil tries to take hold of your mind, the wandering. And then from the wandering mind, he brings in the wandering spirit. That's what it's talking about. And so Lee Marvin made that very well known, wasn't he? You know Lee Marvin? Yes. The singer, I was born under a wandering star. He had the, the planos over his life. And I need Jesus over my life. 
I need Jesus over my life. Now that doesn't exclude evangelists. They have a wandering spirit. They're God, but it's a God-given spirit that keeps them wandering. I'm not talking about people that wander for the right cause, but for the wrong cause. Of deception, the enemy comes into their life. Have a look with me in uh, 2 Timothy, chapter 2, and verse 11. I think. No, that's not it. This is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithful, he remains faithful, he cannot deny himself. If we remain faithful, he is faithful, and he, by his faith that is in us, he cannot deny himself. So we need to draw from the power, the presence, and the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus Christ said there, when I return, Luke 18, there he said, and he said, when I return, shall I find faithfulness? He's not coming back for people. He's coming back for his church, his ecclesia, his called out ones, his chosen ones, not his frozen ones. We're chosen, called by the power and to be kept by the power of God as we live unto Jesus Christ, who is the author, the finisher of our faith. Paul, when he wrote to the early Christian church, he said this in, in 2 Thessalonians. Let's go back to 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, and verse 7. He said this, For the mystery of lawlessness, lawlessness is already at work. Mm. It's already working in the church. Yeah. 2,000 years ago. So could you hear it now? You see, Herod is gaining momentum, gaining momentum. It's a snowball effect. You get on top of the hill, you've got a little snowball, you roll it down the hill and see the momentum that it builds up. The Christianity in the church is being diluted because of the enemy of deception who is moving in the church today. There needs to be a spiritual awakening, as Paul said to the church at Thessalonica and Ephesians. He says, awake, my people, awake. Why did he have to write to Christians in the church? Just been born again not very long ago, he said, awake, my people, awake. There, it tells me there is a great indication in the church that Christians can fall to sleep very early. They're either standing on the promises or sleeping on the premises. And I love when I preach, I love walking around to see who's standing on the promises and who's sleeping on the premises. And if you're sleeping on the premises, I'm going to hit you over the head with the Bible. So you can say you were struck by the Word of God. <laughs> glory to God, glory to God. So stand on the promises of God. A true Bible basher. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah, a real Bible basher. Praise God, praise God. <laughs> And he who now remains, restrains, will do so until you is taken away, until he's taken away. But now look at verse 8. And then the lawless one will be revealed. He's going to be revealed. And I, we're living in the last days. Now the last days have been for 2,000 years. When do the last days begin? God has in these diverse times and in the last days spoken to us by his, his son Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1 verse 1 tells us the last days began in that book of Hebrews. He's, that's how he's spoken to us. Are we listening to the voice of God or the voice of the world or the voice of another? And then the uh, lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and will destroy with the brightness of his coming. You know why they're going to be destroyed by the brightness of his coming? Because they're living in darkness. Oh, you go to church. 
My, my son Richard wrote a, a chorus many, many years ago. It was a good chorus, and, and an evangelist came out by the name of Esther King. You know, heard of Esther King? One of the platters? Yes. You know the platters? Yes. Not the plates, the platters. <laughs> Anyway, and, and she came and she said, can I get that song? Because she took it and she, wherever she went, she evangelized. It was, stand up for Jesus. You go to church on Sunday like all good Christians do, but on Monday, what do you do? Come on, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday, what are you going to do? Then you're going to come back to church and stand up again on Sunday. Sunday, saints. Or just saints? Saints of God. Saints of God. That was Richard. Richard's song. And in verse 9 it says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the works of Satan. So Satan is in control. With all power. With all power. Ah, he's got all power. That's why I can do lying wonder signs, wonders and miracles. Lying signs and lying wonders. He's doing all of these things, miracles, miracles, miracles. But are they the miracles of God? No. No, they're not the miracles of God. And with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth. You see, the, the, the Christians are sitting in the church, they're hearing the truth, but they don't have a love of the truth. And with the Word of God, I hear something from the Word of God, and I don't agree with it, I've got to agree with it. I fall into line with it. I sometimes, I, I find, even myself, after 60 odd years as a Christian, I, I read through the scriptures, I'm still finding things 60 years later that corrects my life. But as soon as I discover it in the Word, I've got to bow to the Word of God. The Word of God must take absolute supreme authority over my life. It's not what I say, not what I think, not what others say, what others think. What does the Word of God say? Because the Word of God endures forever. And only those that obey the Word of God are those that are going to endure forever with the Word of God that endures forever. And if I'll read to you verse 10 again. And with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth. They received the truth, but they didn't love it. Come on, there's a big difference. <coughs> you can be married and still not love your wife. You can be married to someone and don't love them. It's not a convenience. It's a personal commitment and relationship with God. Yes that they might be saved. And if they don't start loving the truth, then they will not be saved. That's why you must love the truth, that you may be saved. And for, now look at this, this verse 11. And for this reason, God will send, who will send? God will send a strong delusion. A strong delusion. Now, what is the word delusion? It comes from the Greek word plainy, the wandering spirit. It is a fraudulent, counterfeit spirit. And God's not going to say it created it. It's already in the earth, but God's not going to stop it from moving. It's got a power, and it's moving powerfully. And God is going to leave, release this spirit. Is going to be this spirit is moving powerfully over the church. Why? Because it's separating the sheep from the goats. See, sheep. As I, I said to people here, I, I, I had a friend of mine that I led to the Lord many, many years ago, back in the early '60s, and he had a, he had a hundred acres of land, and he had a hundred sheep. And he invited me down to his property one day and I did it. And the rains poured down and it just pelted down. A beautiful blue sky when we walked around the property. The rains pelted down and pelted down and pelted down for about 10 minutes. And then it cleared up.
But what I saw in the meantime, he had these sheep and he had about five or six goats with him. And all of the sheep, they were walked up in a sheep forming a line, a straight line, one behind the other. And some of the goats were in between. And we were, I walked then around, the, then it poured down with rain after they got out of sight. About a couple of hours later, coming back, I looked over and here's the sheep coming back again, walking through the same line. But in the track there were some puddles. And the sheep walked up and saw the water splash, 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 splash as they walked through. But then the goats that were in the same file, the goats walked up and stopped at the water and walked around and came back onto the track. And I said to him, did you see that? He said, well, they do that all the time. See, that's why so many goats and the sheep, they won't pass through the waters of baptism. They're not sheep. They go, yes, but. That's exactly what the goat does. But. <laughs> Come on. Plainly, that they should believe a lie. God's going to cause them to go fall into a strong delusion that they're going to believe a lie. But I believe Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Jesus is the answer for every situation in my life and in yours. We are fighting against deception. Not fighting against anything else. God has permitted this strong illusion to take place because if he did not, you and I would be no more than a puppet on a string. And God would pull the string and say, David, you've got an itchy head just a minute. But that's not me. God gave me free will. And it is my free will. Choose you this day in whom you will serve. You have free will. And by the free will, every promise of God applies to you. As I quoted earlier today, a verse I love, I love, I love so much. In, in Obadiah verse 17, the last part of it, the sea part of it. Let us go and possess our possessions. Many Christians can't go and possess their possessions for one, they don't know what it is, and two, they don't have a love of the truth to receive the possessions that is rightfully theirs. So they have a treasure chest that is empty. And God wants to fill your treasure chest to overflowing, but it can only be overfilled with the truth. And the truth is, Jesus Christ is the key to your treasure chest. Amen? He is the truth to your treasure chest. So the enemy comes in with a strong delusion, a counterfeit. He tries to bring in, and by the way, from this word planos, it means the counterfeit, and the counterfeit, when he speaks here about it, by causing a straying, and he calls it the straying with piety. Piety. Oh, I am so righteous. I think I could save God. You know, there are those people. That's, all, that's blasphemy, I know. But, no, I am who I am by the grace of God, said Paul the Apostle. Deception. What does Peter say about deception? Is this. He tries to warn the, uh, the Christian church. A, Chris, a, a, a verse we know so very well. Be sober. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Be sober. That is, be sound-minded. He didn't say, it's not talking about alcohol and drinking. He said, but be sober. Be vigilant. Be watchful. Be watchful. How much, how much are you awake? How much are you alert? Do you know what are, as Paul wrote to the church of Corinth and said, we are not ignorant of the devices of the devil. We're not ignorant of the devices of the devil. Now, what are the devices? The word from the Greek word, the thoughts and patterns of the devil. So when he says we, we are not ignorant of the devices, you're not ignorant of the patterns that the devil tries to put in your mind. You might think, oh, I just came up with a new idea. Run it through God. How do you know it was not the devil? Run it 
through God. Let it line up with the word of God. If it does not line up with the word of God, it's not from God. It must come through God. Be vigilant. Because the adversary, the devil, walks about up and down, up and down. Job tells us about this, the devil walking up and down, seeking whom he may devour. No, he's not a pussycat. Yes, he is. Walking around seeking whom he may devour. Walking as a roaring lion. Walking as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's looking, but notice it said, walking like a roaring lion. He is not a roaring lion, he's a deceiver. So he's bringing deception into yourself, trying to convince you that he is that big, vicious, roaring lion that can pull you to pieces at any moment. But no, he's an imposter. He's a counterfeit. He is the one that you must be fully aware of, of who he is and what he is trying to do inside of your life. Now, when you stop and think about this, when did the deceiver first begin deceiving? Well, firstly, he did it in heaven. Then he got kicked out of heaven. So he's now walking around on planet Earth, walking around in planet Earth, and no one to deceive. He's already got all of the deceived with him. He's fallen angels, right? So then God creates man. And then he forms woman for man. So man and woman is formed. So now the deceiver has got a target to hit once again. So he starts walking at them and God makes all of these precious promises to Adam and Eve. Here it is, Adam and Eve, this perfect couple. Just like Francie and I. But no, no. Well, Francie is more so me anyway. And, and he's a perfect couple. And so the devil comes in through the Garden of Eden as a serpent. Now, could you imagine? Here it is. You are in the Garden of Eden there. He looks them up. He sizes. He looks around between. He sees the apple on the tree. He knew that was not the problem, the apple on the tree. It was the pear on the ground. Adam and Eve, that pear. And so he slithers up around this old snake and he opens his mouth. A talking snake. No, he plants the seed in their mind. We are not ignorant of the devices of the devil. He plants the seed in their mind. And as the seed starts planting in their mind, and it wasn't bad, and he qu- has not God said? Oh, immediately he's quoting the word of God. Has not God said? And so they start talking, well, well, God has said. God has said. So I wonder why they go on. And then he adds a little bit more to what God said. Then after this, they go and they touch the tree. They eat of the fruit. And when this is done, God calls out to them. Adam, Adam, where are you? So what do they do? For the first time in their life, they ran and they hid. You notice when you do something wrong, you, you know, you, you drive along the car and, uh, and you've been a little bit of a lead foot and I'm tended that way, tended to be that way there. And when I'm driving along and suddenly I see a police car coming, I always, the first thing I do is look at the speeder. <laughs> That's a good giveaway, isn't it? <laughs> lead foot, levy. <laughs> and so they hid. And where did they hide? They ran and they hid behind a tree. They ran because of the guilt that the devil was now applying in their life and guilt causes people to run from the truth. And they ran. And then, they, they, then when they ran and they hid behind the tree and God calls to them 
And God walks, as he was walking through the garden in the, me, in the midst of the night, the day. And, and he calls to them, and Eve come out, and Adam come out, and he says, where are you? And they came out. And we hid, he said, what were you doing? We hid ourselves. He said, why? Because we were naked. And then God said, who told you? See, they listened to the liar and not the truth. They listened to the lie. The lie said, you're naked. God still wasn't going to condemn them. But the lie now had got inside of them. Who told you? He said, because we're, now we're, we're naked. And so God made them a covering. And he's been making a covering for mankind ever since. First it began in the Garden of Eden. It was through the blood of bulls and goats. And today the covering is by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the only blood that can cleanse us from all sin, from all unrighteousness. And we need to have that perfect, perfect, wonderful, loving understanding of God. They were ashamed. They believed the devil rather than believe God. And, you know, that to me, you stop and think of it for a moment, that's almost inconceivable. They believed the devil instead of God. They actually physically walked and talked with God. We only believe in God. He's invisible. But we know he's in our heart. We know his spirit's inside of us. And we live by faith in that. But this is a couple who actually walked and talked face to face with God and still turned their back on him. Isn't that almost inconceivable? So the devil sees now there is a weakness in all of us. A weakness in all of us that needs to be broken. Who told you so? The devil. The devil is the author of all confusion. God is not the author of confusion. The moment I find confusion comes against me, and it does, I immediately focus back on God. I denounce confusion. I command it to leave my life, and I stand on the promises of God. And sometimes in the early parts when I stand on the promises of God, I feel like I'm only standing on one leg, and that's rather shaky. But then I'm going to strengthen that leg and put both my feet down and I become well and truly rooted in God, according to Romans 15, uh, uh, 16, 19. Let's have a look. Obedience has, uh, Romans 16 and verse 19, for your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. Not stupid, simple. Concerning what is evil, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So now you've got to keep your feet well and truly planted in the word of God. And the more your word, your feet are planted in the word of God, you're going to flourish in the Lord. In Psalm 92 it says, For they who are, have, are planted in the house of the Lord. Planted. Planted in the house of the Lord. Let God plant you that you can take root, take deep root, deep, deep root. Imagine now if these weren't plastic plants. And they're all real. And every Sunday, Claire, or over the weekend, on every Friday, Claire's decided to take them out of one pot and put them into a new one and replant them. What's going to happen? Will they grow or will they shrink? They'll shrink and they'll die. Because they're not being planted, they're being uprooted and they're being transient. 
But they've got the wandering spirit. But they who are planted in the house of the Lord, they shall what? Flourish! When it means flourish, they'll, they'll be like the trees of Lebanon. The trees of Lebanon has this perfect, beautiful white foliage that just falls like, when it, when it falls, it falls like, like apple blossom. When it falls, it falls like snow falling to the ground with pure white. Pure white. But what else does Paul go on and say as he challenges the heart of each one of us? Have, let's have a look in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers. So we're going to have in the church deceitful false prophets. They're false prophets. We're going to be a dead loss. False prophets in the church. Transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Now, your responsibility and mine, but your responsibility is this. When the Bible speaks about prophecy, it also says discern to see if these things be so. So if you've got to discern when there is prophecy, people who come in under the title of prophets, and I can remember in Hobart, in the 1960s this is, Pastor Dave at the back knows this, evangelist as well as I do. He would come in and he'd preach, come in from America, preaching all the way around, preaching the word of God. I got the gift of healing. And he'd ring the churches up and he'd love to church, join in, in particular Pentecostal uh, uh, church organizations that are chain works and he goes through them like the AOG, the CRC and all those, uh, and uh, uh, CLC and all those churches. He'd go through them. He'd visit one church and he came to us too, by the way, he came and uh, introduced himself, and I've been into some of the churches in my organisation, and I thought, oh, it must be all right. And he came in and sat down there, and he said, Pastor, I want you to preach tonight. I said, but you're, you're the guest speaker. The guest speaker who doesn't speak. You're the guest speaker. He said, no, but just call me up near the end. I said, OK, I'm unprepared, so I'll get up and preach. Now, 10 minutes towards the end, he says, puts his hand up, he says, I'll oh, come out now, Pastor, and we'll pray for some people. So, okay, he calls out the prayer line. People come out, about 30 people, I suppose, from the church at this time. And he walks over and he prays for one. He prays for two. And that's it for tonight. So the other 28 were just disappointed. They went back. But he said... But I'm booked in the motel down the road. You know who I'm talking about now, Pastor Dave? Yep. <laughs> I'm booked in the motel down the road. And uh, you can come down there. I've got two rooms. You can come down. I've got one set up as a prayer room. And you come down and just come down and we will pray for you. So I had it set up in the room and a chair set up there. And he prayed for people. And after they prayed, he had a big bowl. And he had a scripture over it. And when Jesus healed him, he immediately charged him. Huh? When Jesus healed him, he immediately charged him. So then you put your money in because he just prayed for you. He just prayed for you. And uh, that was it, so... And when I found this out, I banned him. I also had him pray for my eldest son, Tony. My eldest son, Tony, when he was born, was absolutely riddled with eczema, even on the top of his head all the way through his body. And at the age of two, my son had no hair. He was trying to fashion himself after Yul Brynner. He had no hair. 
I won't pick anyone here. And you... <laughs> no hair. Riddled with eczema. And I got him to pray for my son. And this is about three, four days later after all of this had happened. I'm home. I'm home by myself with my children. I had five children there. I'm home. And he's sitting in the lounge room. I had a warm ray heater going back in those days. And I'm sitting there and he's laying down, he's scratching, scratching himself. We have mittens and things on him to try to stop this. And I looked at him and I passed over him again and I said, God, that man prayed for my son and what happened? God said, but well, you know, he is a false prophet. And I looked at my son, Tony. Michelle is listening to this today, my daughter in Orange in New South Wales, and she would call this. And I looked at him, and then I saw him and I rebuked him. His eyes totally changed. I then rebuked that spirit in him in the name of Jesus Christ. He concorded, concorded and had a twist and turn and roll around. And I rebuked it and I said, You foul, foul spirit, leave in the name of Jesus. Three hours later, his mum came home. And when she came home, she looked at him. She wouldn't have anything to do with him because he had eczema. It isn't that terrible for a woman who calls herself a mother. She wouldn't have anything to do with him. And she looked at him and she, she went out into the kitchen. And she walks back in again. And she said, He's different. What's happened? All of the eczema had gone. On the top of his head, his face, all the way down his body, he was riddled with red marks and eczema and everything else was all gone. Even on the soles of his feet, he was like Job. On the soles of his feet. And he had one little scratch just down there that God left. Just one little scratch where he'd scratch it with his fingernails. And you look at him and said, he changed, where's his eczema? God healed him, delivered him, and set him free. God's in that business. Don't get caught up in false prophecy. Don't get caught up by false prophets. It is a matter of fact, God even goes on to say, in the Christian church before he returns, there will even be false pastors, imposter pastors, Paul said when he wrote to Timothy. Anyway, I come back to this word. Back again, verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of light transforming themselves. Now, I can't pronounce that Greek word. It is, uh, I've got it written down here, meta asha Myathea ida Zaya. Okay, it's too big. Its alphabet is far too big. I haven't got a computer wide enough to take it all in at once. That means he, he puts on a disguise. He wears a mask. by accommodating himself. He is self-invited. He does not come in by invitation. He invites himself to come in and affect and deceive as many as he possibly can. He is self-appointed. And look at the rest of the verse. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself as an angel of light. Who knows? I'm an angel of light. Who's inside of me? You've got to work it out. Just because I'm a Mr. Nice Guy doesn't mean I'm a Mr. Nice Guy. Mr. Nice Guy wears a mask. You ask Cliff Carey. 
He wore a mask. He was called the mask, wasn't it? Where, him, you, oh, who? Someone, Kerry. No, Kerry. <laughs> Jim Kerry, the mask. He, here he is. He's an angel of light. He's transformed himself into Mr. Nice Guy in the church. I care for you all. I love you all. But I'm pulling you down. You know, in the Christian church, we look at the Christian and we mark the Christian by the gifts. The nine spiritual gifts or the 17 gifts and all that we have in the church. But Jesus Christ was smarter than that. That's why he's a lot smarter than us. He said you will know them by their fruit. The fruit they carry. Not whether they got the gifts because all of the gifts the devil's got as well. Don't be deceived. Does the devil raise people from the dead? Point the bone. And you got Mr. Ben Bones running around everywhere. False healings. False prophecies. False miracles. But by their fruit, by their fruit, you'll know them. Now, what is the real inside? What is the real person inside? Not just Mr. Nice Guy, whilst it's convenient, but what about when it's inconvenient for Mr. Nice Guy? How nice is he then? How nice. By the fruit. As Paul said, though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but if I do not have love, one of the fruits of God, if I do not have love, I am no thing. Nothing at all. It's more than just having gifts. Desire gifts, yes, by all means. But make sure the gifts flow with the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. That's what the devil hates. You see, the devil hates the fruit of the Spirit. He attacks the fruit of the Spirit. He attacked it Adam and Eve with the fruit of the tree. He attacked Jesus in the Garden of Eden with the, again with bread of life. Food. He tries to attack us with all these things. But how much do we rely on God? How much do we rely on Jesus? How much really do we know and understand of the Holy Spirit? There's one thing my wife and I made agreement with many years ago. As much as I love her, she knows I love Jesus Christ far more. And I also know this, that as much as she loves me, because I'm lovable, She loves Jesus Christ more than me. And both of us put Jesus first. Not second, because if Jesus is second in your life, he's last. There's nothing in between first and second with Jesus. You're either in or you're out. How much? How much do we love him? How much do we trust him? Have a look at Matthew. 23, uh, 24, rather, sorry. Matthew 24. Verses 3 and 4, we're going to look. Now, as he, Jesus, sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, in secret, a little bit of embarrassment and a little bit of rivalry, They came to him saying, tell us, when shall all of these things be? And what will be the signs of your coming and of the end of the age? When are these things going to be? And Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceives you. Take heed. That comes from the Greek word planeo. Take heed that no man deceives you. And that word planeo talks about planets that have exploded and now become fallen stars into the universe and beyond, into planet Earth. 
The fallen stars are the fallen angels. That he's talking about. Take heed that you do not become deceived. Then that deception, this is the big thing that we need to fight against in all of our walk with God. Beloved, I want the word of God to minister into your heart today because why? I love you all. I love every one of you here with the love of the Lord. And every one of you here is like my family. You all mean so much to me. And I mean that sincerely. And my wife will tell you, I love every person here sincerely, and she knows this, that I would lay down my life for those in whom I love. And I speak this sincerely, and this has been a part of my life, as one being a soldier and two when I got converted I learned to love I love I love but I love with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ I love him more than I love any other soul yes I've been accused of being fanatical fancy that even by Christians I am are you ready I want to in the next few minutes, the singers and musicians get ready to come back. Because I want us to start singing a little bit more in praise and worship. And I'm going to just finish on James chapter 1. In the book of James chapter 1. Okay, just a James chapter 1, verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation and no shadow of turning. God is so straight that the shadow he casts is black or white. No shadow of turning, no grey. No variation. No variation. Of, and go back to verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Who wants to be blessed today? Who wants to be blessed today? Who wants to be blessed today? Yes, okay, Lord. God, we're going to endure Amen. temptation. We're going to let the tempter take us on and we're going to come out more than a conqueror. I don't want to be tempted. But blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life. I'm no longer a deceive, deception. It's a reception. I'm getting the reception from God. I'm getting the reception from God right now. which the Lord has promised to those who love him. This is the promise of God for those that love him. He's going to challenge your heart through praise and worship. How much do you love him? How much do you love him right now? Do you want to be a receiver, a receiver of the anointing, a receiver of the anointing that will break the yoke off your life? Come on, this is the, the life we live today, the experience we have in Jesus. Let that light shine all the way through you. And it says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But, look at it, I'll finish on this. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. The reason why we fall is because we like what the devil is, the carrot the devil is dangling before us. But we need to come into the place that we see beyond the carrot. We see into the glory of God. Into the glory of God and God today. In praise and worship in this time. He wants your eyes open. He wants to take the reins of your heart. And he wants to guide you and direct you in his way that you should walk the way. He is the way, the truth and the life.
So thank you, singers. Just come into his presence. 